All right, I think that's our cue. Welcome everyone. My name is Todd O'Hare with the Montana Chamber of Commerce and we have Bridger Malum here, our Director of Government Affairs. Give us a little recap on where we are the 15th week of the legislative session. Just as part of our normal heads up, we record the first portion of this weekly um, video conference. And then uh, we stop the recording and, and open up for any folks that may have any questions. And so we're rolling through this thing, Bridger, and um, the pace of the work is changing. Um, as legislators turn their focus more and more towards how they're gonna balance the budgets and some of the big weighty issues around that. But nevertheless, how did this last week fare for chamber priorities? Thanks, Todd. Yes, so it was, this ended up being a big week for, for two of what we've started to dub as the chamber's core four priority pieces of legislation for uh, this legislature. And these two bills that I'm gonna reference here have both passed the legislature um, in their, at their respective stages and are now, each of them are on their way to the governor's desk and we expect them both to be signed. And we've mentioned these before, but I'll highlight the importance of them now and that Senate Bill 338, and this was this was carried and sponsored by Senator Mike Lang of Malta. So huge kudos to him for working with us on this one. But this is that bill that, that essentially makes it for any private property owner, they don't owe a duty of care to an unwanted trespasser on their property and, and that's really important for business owners. So if, if somebody crosses onto your property, whether it's your land or a piece of machinery that that's, because that's considered property too in this bill and they hurt themselves, that, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a personal risk that that person's taking now. And we're memorializing that in statute so that that, that business owner is not liable for that personal injury for somebody who was uninvited on the property in the first place. So that's gonna be a really important standard going forward when it comes to whose liability is it when there's a personal injury that involves somebody who wasn't invited to that property in the first place. So that's on its way to the governor's desk, Todd, as well as Senate Bill 251, Senator Kerry Smith of Billings. He's the majority leader of the Senate. He's been our champion of this bill from the start, has been a, a great proponent of tort reform in partnership with the Montana Chamber for as long as he's been a part of this process for several sessions now. And this is just another capstone to the great work we've been doing with him. Um, and again, this, this legislation is going to, to, to better ground in reality, Todd, what, what damages in personal injury lawsuits are going to look like for involved businesses in those lawsuits going forward. And we, and with this bill, I think the bottom line that businesses need to know is that damages are going to be based on on monies that were actually exchanged and what it actually took for that for that injured person to get the treatment that they needed and it's not going to be inflated based on 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 charges that were never paid for and then punitive damages on on the business owner are what are actually grounded in reality and not inflated to the point of running that running that business out of business unnecessarily oh, oh, because of because of this issue that we have now solved with Senate Bill 251. So um, Todd, and I mean, these, of course, are in addition to core pieces of legislation we'd already passed this session dealing with business liability protections with COVID and, and some big home runs when it comes to employment law with the amendments to wrongful discharge. So it's been a very successful session for the overall Montana business community as a result of these uh, these developments, Todd. Yeah, these are great news pieces here. Um, as you know, uh, Envision 2026 is our strategy, and that's what has identified where it is that we focus our efforts. And as part of that, general business climate was an issue that um, business members of the Montana Chamber identified was a challenge in Montana that we needed to work on. And within that was some of the tort reform actions that you know we need to do more in the tort reform area in order to narrow the uh, number of ways that businesses can be sued. And so here it is, we've knocked four of them down 
uh, big ones that the chamber let, that the chamber itself led, and we've not touched a lot on all the other bills that are moving through the chamber. Were was also uh, big supporters of, but these were these were specific chamber idea bills that were led by our members and and drafted. That uh, some of this work began uh, clear back last summer. So um, these this is great stuff. And thank you, Bridger, for all the great work you've done on this. And turning out to be probably one of the most successful sessions this organization has had in a long, long time. Well, thanks, Todd. And, and yeah, it, it's all it's all collaborative work. And really, to be able to put it, it, it's always said, and this is absolutely true, that it's way harder to pass a bill than it is to kill it. And it takes it takes a coalition of supporters, you need to show the legislature that there's broad based support. So our leadership on these bills was obviously crucial. But but so too was the partnerships that we've had with other trade associations, members, and other business folks that helped us that helped us drive that message that these four bills are going to make a meaningful impact to attracting more business investment down the road. But Todd, the the fun doesn't end there. We still have a couple of weeks left of this thing, and while some of our big bills are are essentially through the process, and 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 as we anticipate, will be signed by the governor. This legislature over the over the course of the next two weeks or so is going to have to figure out and pass a, its state budget, the only constitutional requirement of the legislature, and that's looking at about 12.6 billion in spending over the next two years, and that's the budget for the whole state. And so that's that's a big deal that still needs to be sorted out. In addition, of course, to the two other developments that are relatively unique to this session, and that's allocating about $2.1 billion in, in new federal COVID relief money and putting together the regulations and, and allocations of the, of the taxation of recreational marijuana. So there, there's going to be a lot going on here in the near term, Todd. Um, and, and I guess I'll just hit on a couple specifics on those issues here just for the interest of, of the viewers and listeners. House Bill 2, of course, is the bill that, that comprises of the state budget. And then, of course, House Bill 632, as we've mentioned before, is the allocation of the federal um, ARPA COVID relief dollars. As, and I want to update real quick with this group of where those stand. Both of those bills have, have passed the House and the Senate, although there have been amendments on, on each side of it. And so what the plan is basically is for the the house and well that actually it will be the house the house will take house bill 2 and house bill 632 and then what they're going to do procedurally here is not concur on the amendments that the senate had put on them and this is all intentional it's part of how this is going to work and it's going to take both of these bills into free conference committees and and for those of you that don't know how a conference committee in the legislature works this is when if there's disagreement between the senate and the house on changes to a particular bill, you basically are gonna take three members of the House and three members of the Senate, and you're gonna put them together in a room and those six folks are gonna hash out the differences between the Senate version of that bill and the House version of that bill and come up with something that hopefully everybody can agree on. And then once that conference committee makes those decisions, that version of that bill will go back to both the House and the Senate in which they're both going to essentially simultaneously vote on the same thing. And that's how differences between amendments in the Senate and the House get resolved, Todd. So that's going to be a, a huge part of the attention and the political oxygen of the rest of this legislative session. And, and one more thing I'll add, and that's going to be an interesting caveat now, uh, if, if anyone is paying attention to the news here, it was, it was discovered last evening that there has been um, a, another COVID scare in the Capitol, and and it and it and it's one of which there were enough contacts with legislators to warrant them not meeting on the floor today, and that's going to have some significance because for a, we don't know how long that's going to play out and how long they're going to have to delay holding floor sessions, and it takes holding floor sessions to be able to knock down legislative calendar days. And so we're sort of at this standstill at the moment until the House and Senate can either decide to just have their floor sessions more remotely than they used to or decide that they can come back in. 
and continue to uh, work down the clock of the session, Todd. So as if we needed some other thing to uh, make things more interesting, uh, we got that as of yesterday. Fascinating, though, that we've made it three quarters or better through the legislative session before this um, before this cropped up. I think there were a lot of folks, myself uh, included, thinking that there would be some sort of a major outbreak early in the session. And it just it just never materialized. And here we are um, getting close to the end. And uh, this hurdle was thrown up here in the within the last 24 hours. So Bridger, can you give us kind of a idea at this point from where you're sitting, how you see the uh, the distribution, how they're actually going to determine how they're going to spend that uh, 632 money over the interim. Have you got an idea for how that's looking? Yeah, Todd, and I and th this might be repetitive of some explanation I've given on similar weekly capital connections before, but there, it's still things are still evolving. But I think that the core components of the allocation strategy are that. It's going to divide into buckets, in some cases, several hundred million dollars into certain categories, whether it's broadband, whether it's uh, wh whether it's COVID-19 specific recovery needs, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's Department of Justice, going to allocate those dollars generally and not picking projects now because the politics of that would have made a bill like this impossible to pass. And instead, what they have done is set up interim style commissions to take their respective bucket of money and and then start to field ideas from the public um, and of course the respective agencies that might fit in those buckets and 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 those interim commissions that will be made up of legislators and appointees from the governor's office will then make those specific determinations over the course of however many months they have before the deadline to actually allocate the dollars or have to give it back. And so, I, Todd, I think this, given, given how the politics of a legislative session works and how we've seen in the past that, especially infrastructure bonding bills have gone down because of the politics of picking projects, I think this is a smart move for the legislature to do a general allocation and not try to get into the project picking now and leave it to an interim process to do it. I think that's the most realistic way a bill is going to get passed. Interesting. And um, so while we're theoretically close to the end of the legislative session, it's going to be but a mere breath, right? And we'll be back into a pretty intense interim period in uh, dealing with these federal dollars. Yeah, Todd, it, it truly is a use it or lose it situation. And as I had learned in one of the hearings, it it's not as though we have the option to just give our allocation of COVID dollars back to the federal government and that that goes back into reducing the national debt. I, I believe the way it works is that if we give any money back, it's just going to get reallocated to other states. And so that I think the mantra that the legislature is taking, no, no matter what your personal stance is on whether we should be accepting money like this from the federal government is that if we don't spend it, some other state's going to get the benefit. And so we might as well use what we have. And so there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of pressure to, to spend the money. And I think the more ideas that people can start to think of or, or things that you're hearing about as far as good ways to use the money, start thinking about those things now, because there will be an interim setup to start making those pitches. And, and it's going to be sooner than we think. Because I think some of these deadlines to move this money could be towards the end of this summer. It's going to be rapid right so and within 10 days it's probably safe to assume that the governor will have signed the last of the chamber's core four as you've termed it and we'll have um um four of our major our major priorities uh officially on the law books here within the next 10 days is that a fair estimation yes todd i think that's looking good i think just pending any any delays as far as this COVID scare is concerned, and if that if, if that interrupts how staff are enrolling the bills and getting them through to the governor's desk, there could be some delays in that. But but otherwise, it's through the legislature, so it really is just a matter of the procedure it takes to get to the governor's desk and and for a signature. So we're very excited there. And of course, I, we 
we're, we're going to be watching very closely to how the rest of these major budget bills line up because, I mean, infrastructure investment and workforce development, of course, are other core components of Vision 2026. And that, that's going to be addressed, both of those are going to be addressed in a big way when it comes to funding for core infrastructure projects, as well as, as funding for education um, and some of these workforce development programs that we've been supportive of in the past. And so uh, we do have an interest in seeing those bills getting shepherded along as well. And uh, yeah, it doesn't just end at our, our core four, but to get those done is going to be it's going to be great news. All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and stop recording at this point here and we'll just